Welcome to the House of the Lord's YouTube channel, where you can experience all the dynamic teaching and preaching that happens in the house. Thank you for tuning in, and we pray you are blessed, encouraged, and changed by the word you receive here. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to come into your presence once again. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to protect our, our pastor and our first lady, Bishop Johnson and Pastor Kathy. Lord, we ask that their vacation will be restful and they will come back rejuvenated, Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask that the anointing on this house would fall on me for this moment, that I will be able to say what you've given me to say that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. Lord, I just ask that you will speak into our lives, that we will leave here different than the way we came in, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Last November, I read a book by Dr. James Cone entitled, The Spirituals and the Blues. Uh, in this book, he talks about the context surrounding the birth of these two styles of musical expressions. See, the spirituals were produced during times of slavery, while the blues were birthed out of the Reconstruction period. Therefore, we have two styles of music, both on either side of the Civil War. In his book, Cone surprisingly brings W.E.B. Du Bois into the conversation because he actually wrote an essay called Of Sorrow Songs, and that was actually the first significant interpretation of slave spirituals. In Du Bois' famous work, The Souls of Black Folks, he, he talks about his fascination of the tension within the spirituals, the tension between hope and despair, the tension between joy and sorrow, the tension between death and life. How could these people who were considered to be subhuman have the ability to embrace and articulate the polarities of life in their music? I find this to be beautiful for the same reasons as Cone and Du Bois, for a people who were forced to live in such dehumanizing predicament through their songs were able to communicate that through all the sorrow of the songs, there still was a breath of hope in their music. Through all the sorrow of the songs, there was still hope and faith in the ultimate justice of things. In other words, they were able to hang on to hope without falling into despair. As a group of people living under the harsh reality of slavery and segregation, the spiritual and the blues, it shows us what black people did to keep it together and endure during that time in history. I said all this because it is, it is through the hermeneutical lens or the interpretive lens of that I'm going to attempt to preach and teach this evening of a spiritual ethic with a blue sensibility. A, a, a spiritual ethic with a blue sensibility. See, see, ethics are a set of moral principles that need to be guided by a spiritual perspective, while a blue sensibility is, is, it speaks to the, to the complex nature of emotional influences that are demanding a response from us. There are all kinds of emotional, complex influences that are demanding a response from us. When an unarmed Black man is gunned down while eating ice cream in his apartment. And the perpetrator is only sentenced to 10 years in prison. We need a set of spiritual ethics with a blue sensibility to navigate our way through this cultural mess. 
See, collectively and individually, we have been going through some painful seasons. Some of us have been going through years in painful seasons, but we must recognize that painful seasons are also seasons of preparation. Therefore, in spite of what is going on in our lives and around us, we must continue to feed our faith and cultivate our patience. See, in many ways, we as a nation, as a church, and as a people, are at a watershed moment in time. Something has to give. Things just can't keep going on the way that they're going. And it's because of that that we must handle this moment appropriately so that we can see a mighty move of act in our lives. There is a watershed moment in the book of Second Chronicles that came at the end of an extended period of suffering where God moved in a mighty way. So it is to that end that we will find ourselves in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 23, and verse 1. I'm only going to use the A clause of the verse this evening, just, a, just the first phrase, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation of Scriptures. The Bible says, In the seventh year, of Athaniah's reign. That's all I need right there. In the seventh year of Athaniah's reign, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I promise you there's a sermon in there. I, I promise there's a sermon in there. T to set the context for this preaching moment, I would like to tag this text with the thought, the time is now. The time is now. Let's, let's begin by looking at the situation that surrounded First and Second Chronicles. See, the books of First and Second Chronicles, they retell a lot of the history that is actually given us in the writings of Samuel and Kings. But it is still important that we let these narratives stand on their own for two very significant reasons. The first reason is that Chronicles is written to a different immediate audience. See, the audience of Chronicles has recently returned from being in exile in Babylon, which means that the writer is attempting to answer a different set of questions. See, the writers of Kings and Samuel, their, their audience, they were trying to answer the question as to why they were being sent into exile. But see, since these people have returned, Chronicles is answering the question that now that we've returned, are we still the people of God? Now that we've returned, but we have no monarchy, we have no king, what does God's promises to David and Solomon mean to us in our current context? The second reason that we need to let these historical narratives stand on their own is because the author takes a completely different perspective. The author is doing something that is called taking a priestly perspective. See, what he is doing is he's actually reinterpreting the events found in Kings and Samuel. He's doing that because he's trying to encourage their faith, and he's trying to encourage their hope by showing the exiles that when they returned, that they were still the people of God, that God had not abandoned them. God had not let them, although he had to let some consequences come into their lives for their situations, but he still never left them, and he never forsook them. One thing that is apparent in all of this is that the chronicler, he's trying to explain how a people who found themselves as part of such a catastrophic event, how they managed to survive whole, how they managed to find freedom and rebuild their lives. See, they were not content to let their oppressors have the last word. They were not content to let their oppressors define their history. See, they had an optimism that used the pessimism of life as the raw material to create their strength. See, it is through a spiritual ethic and a blue sensibility that enables us to remember that the absurd, that the oppressive, that the destructive nature of our current context, it will not have the last word. It will not define who we are. Remember that Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail. As we move in and zoom in a little bit closer to our text, there is a problem in the text. The problem is actually our verse for this evening in the seventh year of Athaniah's reign. See, Athaniah was the mother of Hosiah, who was the grandson of King Jehoshaphat and the son of King Jehoram. See, Jehoshaphat was considered to be a mighty man of God and did what was right in the Lord's eye, but somehow those qualities did not get passed down to Jehoram. And the Bible says that he was really such a messed up dude that, that when he died, the Bible says no one was even sorry that he died. To the point that he was a king, but the people decided that they weren't even going to bury him in a royal cemetery. After the death of Jehoram, Isaiah is then installed as the king of Judah. Now, when the Bible gives a summary of his reign, the Bible says that he followed the evil example of King Ahab's family, for his mother encouraged him to do wrong. Now, this is interesting because Isaiah is the king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. And Ahab is the king of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. So where is the connection between the two, Athaniah. See, Athaniah, her father was Ahab, which meant that her mother was Jezebel. Now, now, I, I have to, because of the series we just came out of, I have to make a disclaimer that, that in the series, Bishop talked about the caricaturing of black women through the term of Jezebel. That is not how I'm using the term this evening. I'm using it in the same way the Bible does as an example of a particular kind of evil. See, from the way the Bible uses Jezebel, we can understand that she was a murderous and conniving kind of person. And now this then gives us some, some valuable insight into the type of person that Athenias was. Furthermore, the Bible says that she used her influence on her son by encouraging him to partner with King Joram. And in fact, it was that partnership was the reason why he got murdered in the first place. But see, here's where the story goes from bad to worse, because when she finds out that her son has died, she does not mourn, she does not cry, she does not seek revenge, but the Bible says that she went on her own killing spree killing her own grandchildren so that she could gain control of her son's throne. See, with this being how she started her reign, it gives a clear indication of what life was like in Judah with a woman like Athaniah sitting on the throne, the kind of woman who would kill her grandchildren for an opportunity to have some power, the kind of woman that wanted something so bad that she would sacrifice her grandchildren to get it. As a parent, I find Queen Athenia's actions both appalling and convicting. I find them convicting because, remember, the scripture is supposed to be a mirror. So when we read difficult passages, we can't be afraid to let the mirror shine in our own lives. And it caused me to have to ask myself the question, am I sacrificing my children for some personal gain or something that is unfulfilled in my life? See, at a fundamental level, an Athenia used her son and her grandchildren to create an opportunity to fulfill something she thought was missing. Are we doing this when we force sports on our children? because they, we want them to be the star that we weren't able to be? Or are we doing this when we force our children to take a certain career path because it was the career we wanted but couldn't have? Are we doing this when we don't support our children's interests, not because there's something wrong with it, but because we just don't understand why they're interested in that in the first place? When the Bible says in the seventh year of her reign, it is telling us that for six years the nation of Judah was living in a painful reality. 
This reality was, was painful and it was experienced nationally because when Athaniah killed her grandchildren, it would have appeared to the nation of Judah that she had just killed the promise of God. I say that because, remember, God promised that a descendant of David would always be upon the throne. But if Athaniah had killed all of her grandchildren, then that would mean that she had killed off the line of David. See, the nation is already experiencing a decline in temple worship, or like in America, a decline in church attendance. Since the death of King Jehoshaphat, and additionally at the time of this passage, they are going into their 16th year under an evil government. And now they have to live with the reality that seems that there is no hope of restoration in sight. But I thank God that things ain't always like they seem. I thank God that this is not the end of the story because God had a solution to what was going on. And, and the solution is found in a woman named Jesheba. Let, let me introduce you to Jesheba. She's not a popular character in the Bible, but, but she is the wife of the high priest Jehinadad and was the sister of Uzziah. And then Athaniah, when she began killing off her grandchildren, she was actually able to rescue her nephew, Joaz. She rescued her nephew and his nurse, and she hid them in the temple. <laughs> so, so, so consequently then, for, for six years, when, when people thought that the promises of God had returned void, for six years, when they thought that the devil had made God out to be a liar, for six years, when, when people thought that God could not fulfill his promises, God was at work in the church. When, when society was going crazy and a spirit of murder was running wild, God was working in the church and he was working through a woman who was working out of a spiritual ethic with a blue sensibility and she knew that something had to be done because the time is now. As we go deeper into this text, we can see that when society was going crazy and the future of the nation was at risk, catch this, it took an older person risking their neck to save an infant. See, in saving the infant, she was protecting the children. In saving the infant, she was protecting the young adults. In saving the infant, she was protecting their future. See, considering where we are as a church, I, I can't rush past this point because in the actions of Jesheba, we can see the importance of intergenerational connections. We can see the importance of intergenerational ministry. See, the, the nation's future was connected to the life of an infant. While at the same time, the life of the infant was connected to the covering of an adult who understood the time is now. See, I have to say that we are living in a similar place in our country right now. And, and the future of the church is connected to our children. It's connected to our young people. But our children, our young people, they need the covering and they need the protection that only a seasoned saint can give them. See, our young people are, are living with a corrupt government and they're living in danger of being swept away and incarcerated or becoming a victim of police brutality. Uh, our children are in danger of being swept away by a school system that is financially segregated and systemically racist. We are living in an environment where our children are in danger of being swept away by the false promises of love by drug dealers and gang members. They are living in an environment where our children are in danger of being kidnapped, drugged, and sold into sex trafficking. But, but what I find particularly interesting is that baby Joaz didn't know 
the level of danger that he was in. But God, somebody say, but God. Providentially had someone in the right place, and he had someone at the right time who could see what Joaz wasn't even aware of or able to see. See, there are times where God will place us in someone's life because we can see what they aren't able to see. Now that we have appropriately contextualized this text, let's add some application to her solution by looking at Josheba's motivation. When looking at our motivation, we must first consider the strength of family influences that flows out of family ties during this time. Josheba, again, was the half-sister of Isaiah. This means that her father's wife, Athaniah, was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. This also means that Josheba was regularly exposed to the idolatry of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. Furthermore, this suggests that, that she was exposed to a lot of violence growing up because she was growing up in a family that was devoted to evil and idolatry. But, but somehow... But somehow, Jesheba was able to escape the evil influences and marry a high priest. And now, in spite of the mess that she was born into, she now is documented in the scripture and stands out as a heroic daughter of a wicked father. See, this is very significant because this is the only place in Scripture where someone who was an Israelite princess actually leaves and marries a high priest. When we look at this, there appears to be both from a natural and spiritual perspective motivating factors in both ways. See, from a natural perspective, could it be that Jesheba saw herself in her nephew Joaz? And since someone reached out and saved her life, she knew the importance of reaching out and protecting the next generation. Could it be that Josheba understood that when she was growing up, her life was also in danger, and because of the family she was born into, she could not see her nephew in the same situation and not do anything about it. But then from a spiritual perspective, as the wife of a high priest, Yeshiva would have known about God's promise as related to descendants of David. As Yeshiva was a woman of deep spiritual convictions who would rather die than stand by and watch Athaniah kill the royal bloodline. From a spiritual perspective, we can see her functioning out of the same faith as Moses, who was willing to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, as we we continue to engage Yeshiba's motivation, we are by default exposed to the power that resides in the intersection between our testimony and our ministry. See, in this heroic act, we can see how her testimony produced her ministry. And in hearing this, we should challenge us to to take another look at how our testimony and gain a sense of how God may want to use that to further our ministry. See, this is why we can't forget where we came from. This is why we can't forget where we came from, because when we do, we begin to see people doing the same things we used to do. And and when we forget, we look at them with contempt instead of looking at them with compassion. See, see, this is why we, we can't live lives that are so insulated that we forget about all of the miraculous things that God has done in our lives, all the times that God has snatched us out of the fire and saved us from destruction. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but the fact of the matter is that most of us would not be sitting here on a Wednesday evening looking to hear a word from the Lord if God had not done something miraculous for us at some time in our lives. Many of us 
would not be sitting here today if God had not sent someone into our lives who was able to cover us when destruction was around the corner. There was, a, there was a friend who called you when you, when you was about to lose your mind. Or, or there was a church member who answered the phone when you was about to call the dope man. There was an accountability partner who called you and kept you from stop making that late night phone call in a moment of weakness. There was a preacher who preached a word of hope when you were ready to take your life. See, we have to remember what God has done for us. The, the saints used to say down through the years, God has been good to me. I can look at the ways he's made. I can look at the times he picked me up and turned me around and put my feet on solid ground. I should be dead and in my grave, but God stepped in and delivered me right on time. Is there anybody in here that knows that he deserves all the praise and all the honor, who knows from experience? that God is a way maker and a miracle worker is there anybody in here that knows that the keeper of your soul neither slumbers or sleeps yes. see I, I am reminded of an old story, an old story about a famous painting called Checkmate. I, I put a copy of the picture in your notes. See, checkmate is a term used by people who play chess. And in chess, a player is in checkmate when one player has put the other player in a situation where it is impossible for them to win. It, it is impossible because no matter what move that player makes, the other player will capture their king and win the game. See, in chess, the king is the most important piece on the board. Now, this, this famous painting that is in your notes is now part of a private collection, but at one time it was on display in the Louvre Museum in Paris. That picture depicts a king having a chess match with the devil and the angels are watching. Uh, the, the devil has a smug look and a pleased look on his face while the king has this disturbed and, and confused look on his face. And, and this is because the pieces on the chessboard are to make it appear like the devil has the king in checkmate. See, the story goes that, that as a tour was going through the Louvre Museum in Paris, the, the tour guide brought a tour group to this painting. And the tour guide, uh, when he came across the painting, he explained the meaning of the painting, and then the, the tour moved on. But there was, there was one man who stood behind and kept staring at the painting and staring at the painting because, because he was a professional chess player. And, and because he was a professional chess player, he, he could see something that the untrained eye could not see. And as he stood there staring at the painting, he, he began yelling, that's a lie, that's a lie, the king has one more move. See, see. To the, to the untrained eye, it, uh, it appeared that the king was in checkmate, but when the picture was viewed by somebody who had an eye to see, a whole nother reality emerged from the picture. I mentioned this because when Athaniah murdered her grandchildren and took the throne of Judah to the untrained eye, it looked like the devil had won. Uh, to the untrained eye, it seemed like the bloodline of David had been destroyed. To the untrained eye, it seemed like the family line who was supposed to produce Jesus had been wiped off the face of the earth. To the untrained eye, it, it looked like the devil had God in checkmate. But in the actions of Jesheba, we can see that the king always has one more move. See, this 
story is showing us that whatever is going on in your life, whatever obstacles you're facing, always remember that the king has one more move. When you think that all hope is lost, remember that the king has one more move. When it looks like you're going down for the count and you won't get back up again, always remember that the king has one more move. When it looks like the devil's going to get the victory, always remember that the king has one more move. When you're ready to give up and you're ready to give in, always remember. that the king has one more move. We got to praise him for that. We got to give him glory for that. We got to worship him for that. We got to shout for that. We got to wave our hands for that. One more move. The king has one more move. In closing, there is one more, one more detail. I need to bring to our attention. And that is Jesheba's method. See, in closing, we must give words to the method used by Jesheba to save the life of her nephew. See, the Bible has a way of making weighty and profound statements in a way that can make it easy for us to miss the significance of what was stated. The Bible says that she hid her nephew in the temple. She hid her nephew in the temple. So in our text, at the, in the seventh year of Athaniah's reign, Joaz has spent the last six years being cared for and nurtured in the temple when he should have been dead. Or better stated, when Joaz's life was in danger and he was unable to even comprehend the level of danger he was in, his aunt recognized it and hid him in the church. The church was a place of refuge. The church was a place of protection. See, there is something inherently beautiful that engages us on every emotional level. When we think about all the places Yeshiva could have tried to hide her nephew. She didn't even send him out of town. She hid him in the church. See, but she, she chose the church, and, and this method speaks volumes to her faith in God's ability to cover and protect Joaz in a way that only God could do it. See, at the same time, Josheba's method to serve as a reminder to all of us who are currently living out the gospel in the current climate of America. See, now is the time for the church to be the church. But that can only happen when we respond like Jesheba and we're willing to take the same risk. There are so many people of all ages, races, gender that need the safety, refuge, and protection of the church. But unfortunately, far too many are looking everywhere else but the church. And, in, and that is the reason why the time is now. The time is now 
for us to put our love for God above each other and above political platforms. The time is now for the church to walk in compassion and not spiritual pride. The time is now for the church to be the salt and light of the earth. The time is now for us to stop fighting each other and begin laying down our lives for each other. The time is now for the church to stop being silent on issues of poverty, racism, and misogyny. The time is now for the church to be a place of healing and restoration that it was designed to be. The time is now for us to reclaim the power of the spirituals and the blues we talked about earlier. See, we need a, a, a spiritual ethic and a blue sensibility that will empower us to take the same risk as Yeshiva, which will open the door for us to bring people in and hide them in the church. People suffering of the weight of painful circumstances. It will open the door for us to bring them in. It will open the door for the church to return to being the place of safety and refuge that it was designed to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we receive that the time is now. Lord, give us whatever we feel is missing so that we can go out and begin to bring people in that need to be hid in the church. Let us move forward, understanding the importance of intergenerational ministry. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your promise will not return void. We ask that this word will continue to be preached in our hearts and in our minds. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.